so we'll go ahead and get started. I think most of you are, are here and uh, there's no reason not to get started. Uh, today we're going to continue, like I said last class, this is a kind of a repetition of steps and we're going to get to a little bit more in-depth view uh, of what we're trying to do and fundamentally this is about working on the files that we would use to physically build your terrain. Um, so we're going to kind of scrap what we did last class and over today and next class we're going to work on your assignment 202 kind of indefinite or in depth. So um, if you follow along and, and work, you should have the bulk of what you need created by your or for your assignment 202. I'm going to share my screen and give me just a second to get organized here. All right, and I'm going to pull up our Sorry, this was my last class. Let me jump over into your class. Let's, uh, I got to leave the student view here so we can get. And let's take a look at assignment 202. This is kind of a, the direction we're going today is that we're, we're prepping these files. So as part of your assignment 202, we're going to complete exercise 212 and 213. Um, and those are really kind of getting you prepared uh, for, for being ready and, and what have you. We're going to use this topography file and we're going to follow along with this physical modeling 6.1, which is on my website. And it will walk you through kind of how we generate and how we create these, uh, these sides and, and ultimately figure out how to fold this out. Uh, I have walkthroughs that'll that'll help you with everything the other thing i have for your enjoyment is uh an actual in person this was back when we used to teach in person i talk about how you would laser cut and actually assemble these into a piece of topography so it's there um should you want to watch it but that is optional because we're not actually cutting it out um and did i make a mistake It's due on October 17th, but it looks like I failed to change this to October 17th. So I apologize for that. I'll go back and edit that after the fact. Um, our topo model that we're creating is 11 inches by 17 inches when it's finished. So we're going to have to do some scaling to get this right. So let's jump over into our actual exercise for today. And let's see here. We're on 212. There we go. And so this is what we're going to start working on today. So we're gonna, we can use the topography we, we used for 211, or you can create a different one. I did go ahead and log into SketchUp. So I'm gonna take you back to the beginning and pull in a new piece of terrain from SketchUp. Uh, and then we're gonna follow along. This chart is gonna become really important. So I'll use that uh, in just a little bit to show you how we figure out um, what our contour intervals are gonna be, et cetera. You can download that. There's a PDF to download it so you can save it for later. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now, as I said before, um, we have two versions of SketchUp. One is the SketchUp free version. One is SketchUp Pro. That's on the school computers. In both instances, you do have to have a Trimble account to be able to sign in, though you don't have to pay any money. Uh, it's free if you're using it on the school computer for SketchUp Pro. And the free version online is uh, certainly usable. However, the, uh, the three ver free version, I was excited when I saw that you could add a location but I have yet to make the location have three-dimensional data to it. And so maybe some of you know how to do that, in which case we'll, we'll create it using the free version. But for right now, it doesn't appear that I have the option to actually add the, the physical three-dimensionality to it, which is going to cause me to stick with the desktop version of SketchUp, which is right here. I went ahead and I created a brand new file. This is in inches. I'm gonna delete the person. So I'll right-click and choose erase because we don't need that person. And then I'm going to go up to the file menu and go to geolocation and then add location. And this then brings up, and like I said, I've already logged in here. This brings up some general information for me right there. And I can search something to, to, to create some terrain. So I could type in Lake Tahoe, for example. Um, I used to use Yosemite, but it's a little bit too um, hilly. And so we can kind of zoom around and we can pick some part. I'm going down to South Shore because I'm more familiar with the mountains over here. 
Um, and what we want is we want to be able to import a region. Now, right now under region import, it says zoom in to select region. This is too far away for us to actually create uh, an, an import region. Now that we're close enough, we could actually select the region. So let me come over here where we have just mountains. I'll click on select region. It'll give us a little window where we can choose what to select. So let's say that I like that region right there. Now, when I have that, we're going to go ahead and click on import. Uh, import. I thought we had that, but let's go back to the digital globe. I think it has to do with imagery. So let, anyway, we'll go ahead with digital globe and I'll click on import. And there it is. Now, in order to see it in three dimensions, we need to go back to file, geolocation, show terrain. And that gives us our bit of terrain right there. And that's really what we're looking for is to be able to uh, see some three dimensionality to the terrain. And this will work. You can pick any terrain anywhere in the world that you want to work with, but we're looking for something that has some reasonable undulations to it. Okay, so there's mine. That's the one I happen to pick, and we'll go with it. Now, to get it into Rhino, I'm going to go into File, and then I'm going to choose Save As because I'm going to go back a few SketchUp versions. So we're in the current version. I want to go back to 2018 because I know Rhino will accept the 2018 version. We're not really losing anything. Let's go ahead and save it um, in my flash drive, or excuse me, in my um, OneDrive. There we go. And I'll just call this uh, Tahoe. How about Tahoe 2 or Tahoe 2? There we go. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. Like I said, I went back to SketchUp 2018 just in case there were some compatibility issues. I haven't tested it with the current version and the current version of Ryan, Rhino to see if they're cross compatible. Let's go ahead and create a brand new Rhino file. So I'll go ahead and go to File and then New. I'm going to use a large object inches template. And that's important because it's matching up with the units that I used in my SketchUp file. And so this should look familiar when it opens because it is virtually the same. Sorry, we haven't imported it yet. This is virtually the same as what we did last class. So in that scenario, I used uh, the Hawaii terrain, which of course you could still use the Hawaii terrain if you want, but I'll go to file and then import. So this is not insert. We're not inserting a reference file. We're actually going to import. So I'll go to file and then import. And let's go to my... file for today. Those import options are just fine. And there it is. So in the perspective view, if we were to zoom out, we can see that bit of terrain that I brought in. So like I said, you can pick any terrain anywhere in the world and work with it. So I'm going to double click on perspective to make it the full size. And then I'm also going to switch over into shaded mode, just so we can kind of see our terrain just a little bit better. So let's get organized with this. Let's go over to my layers. And I have, um, currently, I have everything that's on this location layer. So let's call this one, instead of location snapshot, let's call it um, uh, SketchUp. And let's create a sublayer for terrain. Let's call it SK terrain. And we'll rename this one to be SK flat. The reason that I'm preserving the flat is just because long terms, sometimes it will actually, if I switch over into rendered, it will preserve the, the photographic texture on that flat. So I want to make sure that I save that. So I'll right click and say uh, change object layer. And we can then turn it on. Oops. Sorry, I had them both selected. And let's take the terrain right there. We'll change it onto the terrain, change object layer. Perfect. And we could turn off the flat, and that leaves us with just this little bit of terrain. So let me go ahead and go back to my shaded view like that. All right, that looks pretty good. So just like I did last class, I need to start to create and, and transform this into its NURBS counterpart. 
This surface, because it's not particularly hilly, it doesn't have those big valleys like we were looking at last time, uh, it's not too bad the way it is, but it would still be a lot smoother if we worked it over um, and used our, our NURBS strategies. So with that being said, I'm gonna use layer one here and I'm gonna call layer one contour X. So I'm going a little bit faster than I did last class because this is again, repetition of what it is that we did last time. So I'm gonna do contour X and I'll do the uh, curve, curve from objects and then contour. But I'm just realizing I didn't actually make contour X the active layer. So let's make that the active layer. And then I'll go up to curve, curve from objects, and then I'll choose contour. It's gonna ask me to select the object contour. That would be my mesh right there. We'll go ahead and hit enter. My base point, I'd like to snap to that end. Remember that end snap though, doesn't actually snap to a mesh. Instead, we need to use either vertex or not. I'll use vertex and there we go. I can snap to that end. I'd like to go straight in the X direction. So let me click ortho and turn that on <laughs> so that I'm not snapping to anything. So you wanna be real careful not to snap to the end. We wanna make sure that we're, we're just along the X axis. There it is. And my distance between the contours, we need to do 100 apostrophe for 100 feet. I've seen students just type in 100, that would be 100 inches. It's really, really small. Nope, it looks like my terrain is so big that even 100 feet is a little bit too, too much. So let's try 200 feet. I'm gonna undo control Z. Let's practice that again, contour. That's my object. That's my corner. Going along the X axis there. And let's do it at about 500 feet. All right, that'll work. Now we need to repeat the process doing a contour Y. So let's change the layer to here to be contour Y. And we'll also make it active. There it is. And now we need to make sure that I'm contouring the surface, not all the individual lines. So we'll go back to my contour command. I've chosen my um, mesh as what I'm contouring. I'll pick the same base point, And this time I'm gonna go off in the Y direction. There it is. And we'll do this at 100 feet. Oh, sorry, I did 500 last time. Let me change to 500. And that will then contour that part. So at this point, if I were to turn off the SketchUp layer altogether, we'd end up with what looks kind of like a mesh of lines. And that's exactly what we're looking for. If we look at it in the top view, we should see a perfect horizontal and perfect vertical. If, for example, and I'm gonna do this one as an example, let's turn off this, I'll use my contour three as an active. This is a place where things would go wrong. Let's say I were to contour this, and instead of going along the axis, I snapped like this, and was do it the same distance at 500, like that. It looks very, very similar. However, if we look at it in the top view, let's go to set view and then top, and we zoom in on it, you can see that those are not perfect horizontal lines anymore. They're kind of tipping and waving. Those aren't gonna work when I go to do my curve network. So we wanna make sure that we don't do it that way, we want to make sure we're directly on the X and the Y. So they'll end up looking like this and like this. Let's turn off the SketchUp again. And now in our top view, we need to do some cleaning. So we've got some little pieces that are hanging over here. Let's go ahead and trim. I'm going to use my cutting object would be this. I'll hit enter. We've got to get in close to a few of these. And then we'll zoom out a little bit and work our way along like that. And now those are all set. We can delete this piece. So I'll press the delete key on the keyboard. Then we'll go back and trim again. 
this one's always the challenging one, so we'll do that one first. We've got to get rid of a few. Oops. Helps if I can type trim correctly. And so we'll clean these up like that. And let's zoom out a little bit. There we go. And we got rid of all those. Hit enter. We can get rid of that little extra piece. So top and the left side are set. Let's trim that one. The bottom's always super easy. What will be the problem if you won't trim it correctly? Because I tried to do it in one of the exercise and I uh, and when I try to make it a mesh, uh, it's it, does, it didn't allow me to choose everything. I needed to choose all the lines itself. So I thought maybe it's because I, wouldn't, I didn't trim it. So before. it's looking for curves that completely contain the surface that you're trying to create. So in this scenario where I have the open edge here, the only way to use this would be if I actually drew a curve that went and touched every one of these points, which you could do to kind of finish it off. I find it much faster to actually trim this off. So either the curve network will fail or you'll get you know, poor results out of it without doing a full trim. Okay. Um, if you do it and it says, you know, these might be the problematic curves that you may have seen that, you can actually do the curve network with skipping some of the curves and uh, still get a reasonably good result. So that, that I'm guessing that's probably what happened for you. Let me save this before we move on though. So I'll go to file and then save, and I need to put it into, uh, All right, here we go. And let me create a new folder. And we'll call this fall of 2022. And this was Tahoe 2. And I'll go ahead and click Save. Perfect. I want to make sure that I'm saving this before I do the curve network, just in case it fails. And as you guys saw last time, when I picked curves in both directions, it ended up kind of failing out on me. So in the interest of time, I'm going to again try to do it just picking all the curves in one direction and the outermost curves in the other direction. I'm not quite sure why it's giving me that wheel here. We'll give it a second and see if it comes back to me here. Usually this is not the place where it, it crashes on me. There we go. So it's saved. So next piece is we need to create the surface along the top here. So I'll pick all the curves in the y direction. There it is. Plus the two curves in the x direction on the two ends. And again, I'm doing this. I would normally pick all the curves and try to do it first. But since we're doing this live and I don't want you to have to sit here for five minutes while it processes, I'm going to simplify it and pick all the curves in the Y followed by the two outermost curves in the X. And I'll go up to uh, surface and then choose curve network. Or if I wanted to use the key command, I type in network SRF. And it's going to give me that A, B, C, and D. Those are my four sides. And we'll let it process for a little bit here. It's a good time to have your tea or your coffee while you wait. There we go. It's still, it's giving us our preview, but we're waiting for that little dialog box to show up. Almost there. All right, and then we'll go ahead and say, okay. And again, we have to wait for a little bit.
Yeah, we're getting there. Give it a little more time. More, more coffee. All right, and let's assume for the moment that it is finished. I'm not sure it has, but I'm gonna go ahead and try to click on it. See, yes, it did finish. So when I click on it, I get that big yellow block and that's because we haven't rebuilt the surface. The detail is too high thus far. So let's go ahead and type rebuild and I'll hit enter. And I'm gonna rebuild it at a minimum of 200 by 200. I'm guessing at 100 by 100 is about right for this scene. So we'll go at 100 by 100. I'll go ahead and say, okay, and there's our new surface. At this point, I can turn off the contour X and the contour Y, and I'm left with just my rebuilt nice surface. Let's double click to make the perspective view active. And there we are. So everything that I've done so far in those, that first 20 minutes or so is just repetition of what we did last class. And I'll repeat this one more time next class on Wednesday, uh, but I'll move just a little bit faster. So at this point, however, we're going to start to break from what we did last time. And we're going to think about what would happen if we were trying to model this piece of topography at a particular scale to build a physical model out. So the first thing that we do is we'd say, okay, well, what scale do we want to build this piece of terrain at if it ultimately wants to be 11 by 17? So to do that, we'd come over and I built this chart for you to help things out. So I'm referring to this chart right here. And that is that we have a lot of information to kind of think through here, but we have our scale over here on the left side. So generally at a landscape scale, we might be at one to 200, maybe it's one to 250, maybe it's one to 500. Those are all common scales, one to 100. We also have our standard architectural scales, you know, an eighth of an inch equals a foot, a quarter inch equals a foot, et cetera. So you can use one of those scales as well. So I'm guessing based on the size of this terrain that we're gonna be somewhere in the one to 250 or one to 200 scale. So let's have a look and see. So let's say for right now that I wanted to, to create a model that was at one to 200 scale. I'd come over here and I'd look at what is the size of 11 by 17. So I'd go one to 200, the size of one to 200 scale at 11 by 17 would be 2,200 feet by 3,400 feet. So I need to actually draw a rectangle that's at 2,200 feet by 3,400 feet and see how big it would be. So let's, I'm gonna do this in the top view. I'll draw a rectangle. I'll say at 3,400 feet, comma 2200 feet wasn't that it and i'll go ahead and hit enter and that's the size of that rectangle so it's pretty small actually we could certainly use it our, that means our terrain is really big so that was one to 200 scale if i wanted one to 500 scale we could come back here and look at one to 500 scale and in that scenario it would be 5500 feet by 8500 feet so let's do another rectangle and this one would be at 8,500 feet, comma, 5,500 feet, enter. And there is a one to 500 scale. So this terrain is much bigger than I typically do. So for some reason, we're getting much bigger terrain. So let's stick with the one to 500 scale. So there's my one to 500 scale. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of judge where I want to cut this. So a lot of times we can kind of zoom in and we can kind of see if I were to switch this into shaded mode, kind of what the mountains look like, there's that curve. So we're kind of getting some interesting mountains there. Yeah, that would probably work. If you like that mountain, maybe I wanna pull this back just a little bit more, right? If we like that particular area, I, what I need to do is I need to get this rectangle onto the surface. So this is where project comes in. You guys remember that command from, I think it was the third lecture we ever did. And that's where we're going to project this rectangle down onto my complex surface. So in the top view, making sure I'm in the top view, it won't work if from the perspective view, I want to be in the top view, it's highlighted in blue. I'm going to type in project. It's also under curve, uh, curve from objects, project. 
And it's going to ask me to select surfaces or polysurfaces to project onto. There's my surface. And I'll go ahead and hit Enter. I hope. And there it is. And so what it's done is it's taken that rectangle that I had and it's projected it so that it goes around my terrain like that. So this size, this piece right here, this 8,500 feet by 5,500 feet at one to 500 scale is going to be 11 inches by 17 inches. So that's the key is that we're translating a particular scale of physical model at the end onto this terrain, and then we're going to cut it out to be that precise size. So now that I have this projection, I can go ahead and trim it. So I'll type in trim, and I'm going to get rid of the surface that's around it. And when I do that, I'm left with just the size of my final model and just the piece of terrain. There it is. So that's a big step. It's getting to the place where I have that final piece of terrain. And this is what I would be modeling if I were to physically create it. So I've shrunk it down. And that size is going to vary. And I furthermore, don't. Uh, it doesn't matter what size or scale you pick here. It just needs to work for your particular model. Now, sometimes you'll be working on something like this. And the assignment or the client will give you, I want a terrain model that's at 1 to 50 scale in which case you'll be stuck with that particular size. But sometimes it's not given to you and you determine your own scale based on how much you want to include. Our sites are very, very large compared to a standard architectural site. Uh, and that's why we're up here in the one to 500, one to 200, one to 250 scale. If we were doing a small scale, right? Instead of picking this giant piece of terrain, we'd be doing something very small. Let's go to new, let me go to geolocation and add location, All right? We're taking whole mountain ranges here, but if we were doing it on the scale of a particular house, right? We'd have to zoom way in to a particular lot, right? So let's say we zoom in nice and tight here, we select a region and even that would be really small. We might only be taking, you know, a small area like this and making our terrain model out of this. So that means the scale would be significantly different than it would be on this piece that we just uh, created. Let's go to geolocation, let's show the terrain. Yeah, and so in this ca case, look at how much more flat this is. So this is much less exciting to build a model on, at least for our purposes. It's a very small scale model. So we're gonna stick with the larger scale where we can really start to see some of these dramatic undulations like it is here. Okay, so we have this already set at our final 11 by 17 size, though it is 8,500 feet by uh, 5,500 feet right now. And so now we need to think about what physical material are we creating this model out of? So you guys have seen on that little preview here in my um, lecture where I create this stuff. Let's get back here. I'm gonna get out of this, come on. All right. I have the video of me making this. So you can see right here, I'm making it out of cardboard, right? So uh, what I need is in order to create this as I need the thickness of the material I'm gonna make the physical model out of. And that's again, where this little chart comes into play. So you'll see after this point going this way, I have contour material thickness, 1 16th, 3 30 seconds, 1 8th, 5 30 seconds, et cetera. So you could actually create this out of a particular material. So in my case, the standard cardboard that they used to sell at the bookstore, it looks like it's an eighth of an inch, but if you measure it really accurately, it's actually a little bit over an eighth of an inch. So I use this 5 30 seconds of an inch as my contour material thickness. For the purposes of our assignment and your work today, you're also going to use 5 30 seconds as the thickness of your contour material. So given that, we come over and we look at our scale. So like I said, mine was at 1 to 500. And I come across here to the 530 seconds column. And I see that my contour interval in the z direction is going to be 78.125 feet. And that 78.125 feet at 1 to 500 scale is 530 seconds of an inch. If I was at a different scale, if I was at 1 to 200, right, I'd come over here to my 530 seconds, and there it is at 31.250 feet. 
So the contour interval is going to be different based on scale and your thickness. Again, we're working with 5.30 seconds. So in, in my case of my model, we're here at 1 to 500. I'm coming over. 5.30 seconds is going to be 78.125 feet. So let's come back in here. And I'm going to rename this layer four. We'll call this topo lines. We'll make it active. And now I'm going to go ahead and use the contour command again. So it's under curve, curve from objects, contour, or I could type in contour. The object I'm going to contour is that piece of surface. I'll hit enter. Now, when I do this, I want to start at one of these corners. So we can use that corner, for example. However, I need to go straight up into the Z direction. So I'll jump out of my view. I'll scroll back here in either the front or the right side view. And I'm going to make sure that I'm going straight up and down. I don't want to be uh, on an angle. I don't want to snap. I just want to be going straight up and down. So my ortho is on, and I'm picking straight up in the Z direction. Now my distance between the contours is going to be that number, that 78 right here, 78.125 feet. So we'll jump back to Rhino and we'll type in 78.125 apostrophe for feet. And I'll go ahead and hit enter. And we can see that it's actually sliced up my piece of terrain into little contours. So if I were physically building this, those are the contour lines that I'd need to build it. So let's double click on perspective, make it big. Let's go ahead and turn off my layer three, which was at my actual terrain. And now we're looking just at those contours right there. So the next piece of this is I actually have to start to create sides. So these are little stair steps that represent the sides of this model. Now, if we were building a physical model, we could use an infinite number of sheets of cardboard and just stack them all together and glue them up and make a big solid block that represents this terrain. The problem with that strategy is that it uses a ton of cardboard. So rather than using all of that cardboard, we're going to build sides and then stack little pieces on top. And you can actually see that in the little video that I have right here, where you can see there's the side with all of those little steps on it. And then I have all the pieces that are going to be glued on right here. So let's jump back over in, into my view here. And I need to start creating those steps. I'm going to start on this side. There's really two strategies for creating these steps. The first strategy is where I'm going to transfer all of these points, the ends of these lines. I'll fold them down, and I'll draw my steps. And then I'll fold them back up. So we can do that using the multiple points tool right here. And I will then make sure my end snap is on. And I'll create a point on the end of every one of these points. I'm not gonna do all of them. I'm just gonna go do this little side here. I'm not gonna go back down the other side. Now I can select all of those points. So let me right click on my topo lines here. Oops. Actually, I'm gonna use a command S-E-L-P-T to select just the points. There they are. And I'm gonna go ahead and rotate those to be flat. So I'll use a rotate 3D if I can type, which I can't today. Rotate 3D. I'll start with this lowest most point. My rotation axis is going to be right uh, along the Y axis in this case. And we'll start from going vertical to going horizontal. So I've taken all of those points and I've just folded them flat down to the side. And at this point, I can start with my line segment. And let's make sure we can snap to points. I'm going to make sure perpendicular snap is on. And I'm just going to start drawing. So I'll hover over a point. I'll snap to perpendicular, and I'll draw my next step. I'll snap to perpendicular. There it is. So I hover, pull back, and I keep working on each side. So for some people, this is an easy method because they're just drawing flat on the ground and creating their little stair step. and then. When the whole thing is done, and again, I'm going to stop there, you would take the whole thing. Let me select the stair steps. We do a rotate 3D again. 
starting at the bottom point, and we're just repeating the process. We're going from here and we're folding it back up to vertical, and there's that set of steps right there. So that is absolutely a perfectly reasonable way of creating steps. Of course, I would keep going through the rest of these steps. There is, however, another strategy. And that other strategy is changing the drawing plane. And for some reason, it's, this is easy for some people to grasp, and it's really difficult for other people to grasp. That's why I show you these two representations. Right now, our drawing plane is flat on the ground. So it's in, at level zero in the Z direction. There it is. But I can change that. Uh, and actually, you can see it a little bit better if I were to make the grid bigger. So let me make the grid a little bit bigger. I'm going to right click on my grid snap and change the settings, which is going to take me to the grid settings. And so let's do a grid line count of uh, 2,000. And we're going to do them every one foot, so 12 inches. Uh, and we'll do major lines every, uh, I don't know, 120 minor grid lines. There we go. So I just made the grid bigger. So the idea here is that you can see that's the plane that I'm currently drawing on. Well, I can change that plane completely. So we do that by going up into this view, and we go to set C plane, and I'll choose three points. So at this point, I'm changing where 0, 0 is, and I'm changing the orientation of my drawing plane. So I'll snap to one of these points. My first direction is just going to be along the um, x-axis here. And my second direction, I need to be going straight up and down. So I'm going to jump out of my side or my perspective view and into either my front or right side view so that I can make sure I'm going straight up and down. And you'll see that when I click, instead of having the drawing plane be flat, it's now vertical along that edge. And so once I've shifted it, it's actually easy to draw directly on the side. So I'll do the same thing where I'll hover and pull down to get my perpendicular snap. I'll hover and I'll pull down to get my perpendicular snap like this. So if I were modeling this for my own self, I would use this method because you're drawing directly in, on the sides and it involves much less rotations, which are places where things can go wrong. So I'd continue drawing and I'd work my way up. At the top of a hill, I'll step up, go straight across, and then I would start going back down the hill here. So as you work today, I'm going to have you kind of try to create the sides all the way around. If you struggle, we'll come back and we'll revisit it on Wednesday. It's also a perfect thing for us to talk about during our check-ins, though a lot of you who come today probably won't be at a place where you're ready for it. But if you struggle with it, you'll come to the check-in on Wednesday and I can help you go through it. The other thing that has a tendency to happen is that you'll find that the corners are very confusing. So all I'm asking for you to do today is to get down close to the corners. So I've stopped there. And next class, we'll resolve how do you deal with the corner. The other question that people sometimes have is what happens when you get to the bottom of a valley? So this point. In this scenario, we actually need to go down the distance of our contour. So it was 78.125 feet. And then we'll come over. And then we'll start working our way back up on this side. Come on. Oops, that was wrong. And there it is. And we'll start working our way back up on this side. So it's entirely possible as you start to create this that you'll run into some snags. That's at the top of a hill there. And we start going back down where something won't be quite resolved. That's OK. And it's actually quite expected as you start to work through this. So do the best you can today as you start to create these sides. There's another side, right? There's part of it right there. But if you've run into trouble at the top or at the valley or at the corner, just leave it open and we'll discuss it next class. So our purpose, like I said today, is to get all of the sides created. So we wanna get as far as we can with the sides. Make sure that you're saving this. So I'll go to file and then save, that's the Rhino file. 
And then I also want you to save or capture a screenshot that shows the sides that you've started to create. For clarity purposes, I probably should put all of these steps that I'm working on on their own layer. I should have a layer called sides just for clarity. So let's change layer five here to sides. I'll make that active. And I will select those pieces. We'll right click and put them on the sides layer. There they are, just so you can see them a little bit better. And then I'll go ahead and I'll capture this file. So I'll click my little down arrow. I'll go to capture, to file, and I'll save that. The other thing that happens is if you're using the cplane method, you'll find that as soon as you try to switch sides, let's say I want to move on to this side here, I need to be able to recreate the cplane. I need to put it vertically on this side. The best method for doing that is to actually reset it to the world top first. So I'll click here, go to set cplane, and then world top. So I always say anytime that you want to move the cplane, go to world top first because it resets everything. And then we can come back and we can go to set cplane. And we'll go to three points. We'll pick right there to start. We're going to go off along, in this case, it's the Y axis. And then we want to be going up in the Z axis. So let's make sure we're going up. And there we are on that side there. So at that point, I can go ahead and keep drawing my steps. So we'd start at this point and we'd start working our way up. A couple things to point out as you're looking at them. If your steps don't look right, check them in one of the side views. So you can see here, all of my steps have perfectly vertical steps. If we looked at it in the right side view, we could see that side there as I start to create it. And they look like stair steps. That's how they should look. If you have ones that are on a diagonal or don't look straight, that's a problem. And so you want to pay attention to that. And then you'll go back and we'll try to fix that particular problem. Like I said, this is a good opportunity during check-ins to get yourself straightened out. If something went wrong, I'll help you. We'll take control of your screen and, and work through any problems that you might have. Okay. So our goal today is to try to draw as much of the sides as possible. You'll save this file and we'll continue working on it next class on Wednesday. Okay. So I'll let you guys go now. It is 12. So let's come back at a little after 12.10, so 12.15 or so, and we'll, uh, we'll go through our check-ins. Remember, we do have check-ins again this week. So any questions that you want to go over, we can go over those. Don't forget to continue working on your assignment 201s. That's coming up. So we want to make sure that's done, even though we've kind of started on 202. All right. Do I have any global questions before I let you go? I don't think so. All right. I'll see you guys back in about 10, 15 minutes at, at 12, 10 to 12, 15 for the first uh, check-in.